English teacher in bilingual education. And so far we have 10, 10 people respond, uh, responding to this um, uh, word cloud. Um, for those who have just joined in, um, I'm posting the chat in the chat again. Please go to this link, www.menti.com. Um, and with the code 56539631, um, um, I like to, I like to know your input on this before I begin sharing. So I see here um, a language teacher or facilitator assisting these three are bigger words, uh, meaning a lot of uh, you think that this is your perceived role is um, as a language teacher or English teacher or facilitator of um, implementing bilingual education, assisting uh, on the side, uh, perhaps not taking the major role in as a as a um, dominant uh, language um, instructor, not language instructor, but subject area instructor. Um, a facilitator, a partner, um, a helper, helper partner, um, a language consultant, a designer. I like that designer um, because a lot, a lot of English teacher nowadays um, are really helping with the curriculum design and giving them, giving the subject teachers also some ideas or um, uh, helping out with the curriculum planning. So designer is um, really uh, um, wonderful. Um, secretaries. <laughs> Um, cooperator, um, ESP teacher, um, getting students to get be ready for EMI courses or um, at the higher education end. Um, conductor, educator, teacher support. What? <laughs> Do I see slaves? <laughs> that, <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure about that, but that's a very interesting uh, thought. Um, um, perhaps, yeah, um, I I just got back from Kaohsiung, um, visiting one of the elementary schools in a rural area near Ida. And um, what I see there are pineapple fields are all around the schools um, and the kids um, parents, they are mostly like far in farming, farmers, and um, and so we have uh, a group of like two teachers, two teachers who are teaching physical education bilingually um, with the help of an English teacher, and that English teacher just um, uh, was just expressing her thoughts and. Uh, mostly um, sharing with me how difficult it is for her to be co-planning the PE lessons with the PE teachers um, because she said that she had to go through all those different PE um, videos online and um, make sure the terms are correct um, and the language is simplified enough for kids to understand. And it's not just that. Um, it The language has to be simplified enough for the PE teacher to be able to enunciate those words. And so it, it's sort of a, like a double challenge. Not only does it have to be simplified enough for the, te the, the, the students, but also for the PE teachers as well. So, um, I can really relate to that. Um, you know, um, right now, um, English teachers are the are the ones who, um, you know, subject teachers uh, seek for help. And perhaps um, there's lots of research and uh, preparation going on, um, you know, in order to to have a uh, a wonderful bilingual lesson presented. To not, and you know. Um, to help kids learn. So, yeah, I think um, we have 66 participants and uh, more are joining. And I'm um, again sharing this Mentimeter uh, link and for you to share your input. We only have, out of the 66 participants, we only have 16 uh, who shared 
uh, your thought. Waiters or waitresses, um, I'm not sure um, how that relates to um, your role as an English teacher helping, okay, providing services to the students, you mean? Okay, language consultant and uh, language partner. Yeah, thank you, co-instructor. Um, I like that. Um, in some of the settings, English teachers are also co co-teachers uh, with co-teaching with subject teachers and and um, I will be providing some examples of that on Padlet. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm gonna stop share. And um, if you have time, I'm, I'm gonna come back to this uh, a bit later. Okay. All right, let me share. Okay. Um, this is not a PowerPoint presentation. This is a Padlet um, that I've collected for, like there are lots of, um, you know, examples there. Let me go, let me uh, take you through some of the uh, items I've listed here. And this is what I'm going to go th through. Um, and and um, okay, so I've, here we have um, Shida, um, they've, they have the bi biology uh, college students or pre-service teachers collaborate with English teachers in in designing Clil Lemon CC or uh, CC Lemon or CC Guava, uh, which which fruit has more vitamin C? Um, um, biology, or, what is it a biology class um, or or um, you know science class? And um, here we have Chen uh, Zheng Guozhong, their bilingual uh, performing arts class. Uh, you can see, um, it, you know, I, I will go be going through more details on that. Um, here we have sixth graders, Guobei Zhao Da Fu Xiao Liu Nian Ji science class. Um, this is Professor He from the science department of NTUE, teaching um, students how to, uh, how to um, express their claim of particular concept and then collect data and then uh, give a warrant for, for their um, claims. Um, this is also, I was uh, privileged uh, to be able to join the Shi, uh, Shi, uh, Shida, Shida's team um, in developing, well, they developed the DNA lessons. I was, I was giving them some feedback on their lessons and also their teaching demos. And this is, this, this is my son um, when he was in sixth grade. Um, uh, he, I, I took them there to, to kind of, kind of uh, let him, you know, um, experience and see if he could understand the DNA, DNA lesson. Um, you have magnetism, science, third grade science, PE um, for kids, also in. Uh, you know, conducted in English. We have heat transfer by sixth graders and they made posters and have students come up here and explain. Second graders, um, um, rain, rain, and this, this was their, their uh, work. And um, we have STEM projects um, and STEM curriculum uh, in New Taipei City, Xingling um, Guoxiao, okay? Uh, this was me teaching science class um, on uh, the le a lesson on mold and mold observation. And yeah, these are all like the my preparation work for for the mold um, lesson. The, and also this is uh, Zhang Shida, uh, also a, a different uh, clue lesson. And this, these were the DNA lessons. Okay. Um, but later on, um, because I, I knew that uh, most of you are MA, MA TESOL or um, doctor students, I've also, um, I will also provide some of the research um, areas that, or, or our suggestions to, uh, that you could 
think about focusing on. These are some of the areas that you could think about focusing on um, the cognitive discourse functions um, by Delton Puffer. Um, scaffolding, um, you know, uh, going into how to provide scaffolding in a bilingual class. Um, there are different four different types of scaffolding. Um, and um, um, I've also provided some of the uh, slides that I created for that are related to uh, bilingual education. Okay. And in, including translanguaging. Okay. Also, um, vocabulary demands for science. These are areas um, that you might be interested in going, um, uh, you know, deeper into um, investigating uh, what exactly is going on in a actual bilingual education class. Um, so you may come up here on Padlet, and if you have any questions, you could leave any comments or questions for me, and I will be um, addressing them uh, later on in the, you know, at, you know, uh, at around um, 1.30, okay. So let me move on um, to my power, my slides, and uh, let's see. So far, do you have any questions? Okay. Feel free to ask uh, questions in the chat or, and um, so I could, it's so, uh, I'm not on a soapbox um, talking to myself. Um, I like to, I like this to be more interactive. Um, two-way communication instead of just, um, yeah, one way. Um, let me pull up my, my slide here. Okay. And, um, and share. Um, could you please type in the chat um, uh, on the Padlet wall um, any topics that you're interested in, just one word? any topics that you're interested in, just like one word, you could type like translanguaging or like uh, science or vocabulary or the, um... oh, great, thank you. Yen Chen, thank you, science. Okay. Bilingual education, thank you. Okay, we uh, let me see here. Assessment. Oh, wow, wonderful. Scaffolding and biology, translanguaging and code switching. Okay, great. Um, grammar. Um, you're interested in grammar. Okay. Um, translanguaging, effective communication in the classroom. Math. Right. I know there's an IB uh, math program in uh, Shida that's very famous. A definition of bilingual education in Taiwan. Um, definitely, a, uh, there's been a debate. Assessment in math, performing arts, social, cultural uh, back backdraw, door run. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, language arts and background. Okay. All right. So, um, so mostly you're interested in bilingual education and um, and some of an assessment in math and science and content language knowledge. But um, I'm going to go through, because our focus is on English teachers' uh, role in bilingual education, I'm going to um, start with, uh, you know, I'm not sure, because I know you guys are more familiar with secondary education. And for me, I'm, um, I focus on primary education. Um, so I've been, I have been training um, pre-service pre -service English uh, teachers for the last um, 17 years now. And um, let me 
so let me give you a brief um, introduction and on um, the role of English teacher in um, problems perhaps uh, we're facing as an English teacher or in bilingual education. Okay, so I know you are very familiar with the English curriculum in Taiwan. Um, it started in 1997 um, in test running English in third grade. In 1998, um, official start uh, in third grade and second grade session. Uh, grade two sessions weekly. And in 2002, Taipei starts learning English from first grade. And 2011, there are three sessions per week for middle and upper grade levels in elementary school. And in 2016, um, some of the different cities uh, began their bilingual education. Um, I think, I believe in Taipei and in New Taipei City, I'm not sure when uh, Tainan started, um, but yeah. Let me ask you, I, because I, my son is in eighth grade, and um, but I'm not sure how many sessions English sessions he's taking. How many English sessions do um, junior high school students take? Do you do you know that? How many sessions weekly for uh, are offered, like English lessons for junior high school students in C? and senior high school students? Um, actually, that's a good question. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, I thought it was uh, that, that they only have three classes. Three classes, but, okay, yeah. three classes per week. Okay, yeah, so yeah. For, for high school students as well. Yeah, okay. yeah, so three in junior high and four in senior high. Okay, thank you, yeah. thank you for that information. Thank you. So yeah, so, um, but starting from the uh, new curriculum, um, kids don't start um, until third grade, but yeah. Um, so this was my like way, way back um, uh, 10 years ago or maybe. Uh, this was one of my pre-service teachers or interns uh, interning at one of the uh, elementary schools and she was practicing this pattern. What's wrong with you? I have a cold. Uh, with the doll and with the doll asking her what's wrong with you and she said I have a cold and what's wrong with you I had a fever so practice practicing this sentence um, outside of the context of the dialogue uh, embedded in the textbook was um, part of the problem of um, you know um, pragmatics are is this uh, sentence used in the right context and through drilling you know that's how kids um, learn English in the past and you know using this sentence pattern what's wrong with you um, you know having a negative connotation to that um, so I'm not sure later on um, later on they they've they've changed the textbook to what's wrong instead of what's wrong with you so that it's more appropriate and um, but textbooks for elementary schools are still grammar based communicative language teaching and kids had to learn through rote map, you know, uh, a lot of repetition um, outside of context and, and things that they've already um, learned in the mother tongue, but you know, so, so um, they're just learning an additional language in English. And our, so our Dilemma right here um, is the 12 year national English curriculum. There's no English class for first or second grade. Okay. For third graders, it's only 40 minutes per week. Okay. And the textbooks is designed around 1200 uh, words. For uh, fifth grade and sixth grade, there are only, there are only 80 minutes per week. And what they all what, what they needed to master was the um, 300 oral meaning in speaking and listening and 180 in writing or spelling out the, the words. So you could see that um, kids are very limited in their uh, vocabulary um, and also you know the textbook was limited within you know within the 1200 words. So uh, just for additional information, and I know you might be familiar with this already, but for, 
Okay, so I do have uh, this information here for seven to ninth grade, 135 minutes per week um, with 1200 vocabulary words uh, and a textbook designed um, based on 2000 words. For grade 10 to 12, um, I'm not sure if this is correct now because um, Professor Wu just told, shared that there's four, four sessions per week, okay? Um, with, um, so 600 words per textbook. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to check, you know, if this, um, information is correct, but the textbooks is designed around 14, 4,500 words. So, um, why do I think, why do you think I, you know, I, why do you think that I think that this, we're, uh, with this curriculum, the English curriculum, um, you know, there's a there would be a big problem uh, for bilingual education. Do you think that it, this this would be you know um, this would be problematic in implementing bilingual education? So yeah. Um, so my my the, the the reason why is that um, right now um, first grade and second graders in New Taipei City and Taipei City um, they're learning um, life skills in English PE in English and um, music in English or um, you know or other different areas in English and and um, and the vocabulary that they were encountering in those lessons are way beyond what is listed here. And a lot of teachers, you know, or especially um, subject area teachers, they, they didn't know like whether or not they should use, they should be teaching these vocabulary because it's not listed in the English curriculum. And um, for sixth graders um, who are, you know, I taught mold um, so for the words on, for the words sporangium or mycelium, those are not um, listed in the in English curriculum. Okay, so, so one of the problem is, um, as you know, as I think the, um, the role as an English teacher, I think, um, is to be able to help students enhance their literacy um, in order to get them ready for, uh, you know, biling for bilingual education so that they could understand and they could learn from those um, bilingual uh, classes. And so that's a big, big step for English teachers. Okay, so I, I think that you've all know this um, very well already. Um, why CLIL? Because the traditional English curriculum for 80 minutes per week does not work. And because they were focusing on learning to use the language um, and it's low cognition, repetition, and drilling. But now with the focus on CLIL, um, you know, kids are learning using the language to learn, and which is more, and it often involves higher cognition. And because of the immediacy effect, because um, when students are learning um, subject areas bilingually, they're learning the they're learning the content now and the language now, and use it now as opposed to learning learning now and using um, later. For example, you know later um, because you know um, some of the terms, uh, some of the questions asked in the English language class, you wouldn't ask them outside of the school setting. So also because of the relevance, bringing connection to students' lives, um, you know, the, the CLIL classes I've observed and I've in interviewed uh, so many different students, um, they all uh, love, the, love their, um, the, the CLIL classes and they thought it's uh, much more fun uh, compared to the same subject area class delivered in Chinese. And um, there's also a reason uh, behind that, as, as as you can see, English starts at first grade in six major cities, 
but not in these cities. Uh, Miaoli, Zhanghua, Yunlin, Jiayi, Pingdong, Hualien, Taidong, um, Doshu, Xue, Xiaohai, Shi, third, they begin um, learning English in third grade. Okay, so if, if not all cities begin, you know, learning, uh, kids be, um, begin learning English at first grade, when they um, are up till the secondary level, of course, there is a, a you know, gap um, uh, between, you know, the advanced kids or the, um, the bottom uh, lower level kids so who really, who are really struggling. Um, and, and, and right now, not all, no, not all schools uh, implement bilingual education. And here are some, I, here are some of the um, uh, projects that's going on. Uh, as you know, Taipei City um, bilingual schools, they offer a third of the classes taught bilingually. And um, they, right now, I, I believe they have up to 54 school, bilingual schools now. Okay, and New Taipei Cities, uh, they have 70 schools offer bilingual courses um, and they're dedicating 10 million US dollars in three years on uh, the following three uh, projects. Uh, there's CLIL, uh, Shang Yushi, and Kechen experiment, bilingual experimental courses and also rural areas. Uh, they're imp implementing bilingual courses and also they're hiring foreign English teachers to help out the rural areas. Um, um, I, I believe um, Fulbright, um, the ETAs are helping them out. Um, also, they have Shang Yu Liang Dian Ke Chen Xue Xiao involved. But also, the Ministry of Education offers subsidies to 200 elementary schools and middle schools for offering their bilingual courses and they're hiring um, foreign English teachers to co-teach English and to, you know, as, as of now, um, Shida um, Professor Chen is helping or uh, foreseeing uh, the whole hiring uh, FETs process. And, um, and uh, as I know, next year, there will be 300 elementary uh, and middle schools offering bilingual courses. So, um, the Ministry of Education has planned to have to to include more more um, primary and secondary uh, schools to implement bilingual courses. Okay, and these are the um, and these are the I was I was asked to um, del, you know uh, give a talk to Fulbright. Um, ETAs and 184 of them and their backgrounds and you can see they're by diverse backgrounds um, and they're currently in Taiwan helping out different schools and developing their English or bilingual bilingual programs. Okay, so um, because 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 CLIL has a um, a, it's very structured in providing scaffolding in, in curriculum design. So that's that's why um, I think it, there's a trend in Taiwan to to be adopting CLIL and planning for bilingual course, bilingual programs. So CLIL, you know, CLIL is just one, um, one way of designing bilingual programs um, or bilingual education. It's not the only way, um, there are different um, various different approaches, but this is um, I, for those who are, uh, you know, currently teaching, um, you know, or in bilingual programs, you're well aware of the four C's models, planning based on content, cognition, communication, and culture, okay. And, um, and there's this, yeah, and often what's brought up is hard CLIL and soft CLIL. And here, hard CLIL, um, the definition provided by um, uh, Ball, Kelly, and Clegg in 2015 is that it's delivered in a subject class by a subject teacher and is subject driven. And a soft CLIL is done in a language class by a language teacher and needs to be subject driven. Both needs to be subject driven, it's just that uh, soft clue is often delivered by a language teacher in a language class. Um, but this is, you know, when, when we talk about hard clue and soft clue, um, 
um, in Taiwan locally, it's not the same because um, of, often uh, when you observe who's teaching the bilingual programs, English teachers are the ones who are teaching bilingual programs right now. Like there's more English teachers involved than subject area teachers because because of the language proficiency, English teachers are more confident in delivering um, bilingual lessons uh, in, in language. Subject area teachers are afraid that their um, language proficiency is not there yet and they might the kids might not understand them or they just can't do it because they don't have the habit of um, you know teaching uh, in English. So um, I had the chance to try uh, try this out, try teaching, um, try designing CLIL and implementing those CLIL lessons in Japan. Okay, this is uh, Kagoshima University Affiliated Junior High School. And what we did was we used 10 different um, uh, country cultures and countries by the themes and incorporate soft skills in um, jaja, you know, uh, cooking, in music, PE, um, in arts and performing arts. And um, it was quite success successful um, uh, considering for these Japanese middle school kids, it's their first, like, Kids, kids do not. Kids in Japan, they, um, when but when I visited, they did not start learning English until middle school. So, um, so yeah, you know, their English proficiency was very like um, at the basic level. They could, you know. So there's we we really need to simplify the language enough for them to. Uh, participate to cook to to perform. We have um, yeah, we have uh, NASA themes and um, uh, role play games and all that. So it was and um, it was a success. And kids, you know, middle school kids all all loved the uh, these lessons and they were quite involved with it. So um, this we were very confident in implementing CLIL in in Taiwan because our kids, our middle school students or our our elementary school students, um, English level is way beyond, you know, and, you know, so, so, you know, this gives us me uh, more confident in implementing bilingual education. And I, so, and I think I personally, uh, I personally love, you know, uh, bilingual education better than our current English curriculum because I think it's more natural way of learning the language, um, you know, and because they're learning the content and by learning the content, they learn the language as well. So I, I, I really uh, believe in, um, you know, this is a belief that this is a good way. Okay. But I'm not saying there would, there are no problems. I, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying um, uh, it's worth a try. Okay. So, um, in preparing for our teachers to become bilingual, uh, ed you know, educators, uh, in, you know, preserve teachers, to, uh, we we had the chance to collaborate with Tai, you know, Wen Wenchang Elementary School in New in Taipei City, and we've observed science game class taught by uh, Miss Chen and uh, Wang uh, Yi Zhong Lao Shi, and um, what we've observed is that kids really enjoy the hands-on work, and it's done in in um, bilingually, and they really loved it. So our our pre-service teachers also try teaching science inquiry, um, um, you know, having them predict, observe, and explain. Uh, and so, yeah, we really we're really struggling with big words such as buoyancy, um, and um, we're really helping the kids, uh, the pre-service teachers to to simplify the language enough for kids to be able to understand um, using, you know, hands-on activity, using visuals, using text and using like modeling and, you know, different multimodalities um, in helping kids understand. 
So as it, so um, Joe is one of the MA students um, and uh, he's currently interning uh, at Yongji Elementary School and, you know, teaching science uh, as well. Uh, you see condensation in this, in this lesson, kids um, are, are more familiar with condensation precipitation and these are big words. Um, so there's, so as an English teacher, or a subject teacher, uh, we had we had to go through a debate whether or not to introduce uh, the science terms as it is or to simplify it. And um, these are some some of the um, you know issues that's uh, brought up uh, over and over again. So you see here how seeds travel in one of my. Uh, our uh, preservist teachers uh, teaching this. I'm not sure if you could okay, hear. Okay. So yeah. this is um, him teaching about um, water dispersal of the seeds and and um, different kinds of seeds like uh, float or sink in the you know in in water. And they learn about how seeds are dispersed by water and. Um, we encourage you know, more interaction and also hands-on lab work, but also science inquiry, not just not just um, going through the lab work and telling them what to do, but helping kids raise questions and answer the questions by, through observation. Okay. So, so our focus is not just fun experiments. It's scientific inquiry. Um, it's not just buoyancy experiment, but it, we we would like them to involve with the science scientific inquiry of predict, observe, and explain, but also there are different approaches to that. Um, this is the DNA um, lesson, and, and I'll go back to the role of English teacher on my on the Padlet. And this is the Makers ABC program um, in co-teaching models. Um, um, co-teaching with uh, with a foreign teacher, and you might you might uh, also have the the chance to co-teach with a foreign English teacher, foreign foreign teacher. Um, this is the different models that they were uh, using um, in their bilingual program, the STEM program, and they they would begin with a drama so that it gives them a, a context for the STEM work and also involved in explaining the theory behind or science behind the project and they would engage in building it. But before building it, they would have a maker diary where they they record the um, the vocabulary in Chinese and then draw it out. And I really like that and, and it helps them build their vocabulary. And um, besides all these, um, they are, um, they've also incur incorporated literacy. So um, for them, it's not STEM, it's stream with the reading uh, included. And, um, and uh, just um, this past more, uh, we, um, the Center for Research on Bilingual Education just um, hosted a bilingual education international conference, and we've invited Do Coyle as a keynote speaker. And she um, she was sharing with us that right now um, the focus of CLIL is not just balancing content and language, but also uh, the, you know to to focus more on plurality literacy. Uh, involving, you know, helping kids enhance their subject area literacy, and 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 that's one big, um, um, you know, area where where subject area teachers uh, need to focus on, but uh, with the help of English teachers as well. So that's one of the things that um, I like to stress. Um, so this is the Maker Diary, as you can see, that kids are um, putting down like dangerous waste and, and you know a uh, draw draw a you know drawing to match up with the 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 um the words and you see that these these words dangerous um safe um sharp and be careful these are these are words that are not listed in the English curriculum in Taiwan but they're learning it through by 
through through CLIL. And when I, um, uh, you know, interviewed the the students, what they um, told me was that they really like the bilingual classes because they get to learn something different um, or a new set of words or new concepts um, that they would not have learned in an English uh, class. And that that's what's uh, exciting, you know, kids, you know, kids really like it. So, so um, these are the vocabulary. Um, as you can see, uh, visual support is very important. And, um, and, you know, here is the circuit you will use, we will use it is, is it a simple series or parallel circuit and they had to, uh, you know, respond to this question, I, you know, by uh, looking at this and decide which one, which kind of circuit it is. And this is fourth grade, okay? So uh, because the word circuit is repeated like 35 times, it's really natural for them to learn the word circuit. And it's all in a very natural setting. We're not having them repeat after the teacher for so many times. It's like, it occurs in a natural conversation. So um, yeah. And then these are sundial, what they've um, boat in a circ, boat, boat with circuit a lot of hands-on activities, okay. So um, those are just some examples of um, bilingual uh, classes that I've observed and are, are or um, shared by uh, Xingling Elementary School, the bilingual team. Um, here, are some of, here are some of the challenges. Um, this is one of the course class that, that I've observed in you know, science class. Here we have the science concept explained in English by an English teacher and uh, science experiment in Chinese by a, chi by a local teacher. And um, so this English teacher had to go over the science concept and pre pre prepare for the lesson because she's never taught magnetism um, before. Um, and this science teachers has never taught science in English before and are not very comfortable in, you know, you know, like explaining science in English. So here we have in one class, uh, one teacher, one language approach. Um, and after observing, you know, so many different classes, um, there are a certain, like a certain number of uh, professors think that this is not the, um, the bilingual mode that we would like to achieve. Um, and we are, right now, we would like more subject teachers uh, to be able to teach in English with the help of English teachers. So the English teacher's role, as you have um, shared uh, previously at the beginning of this webinar, um, is to assist and also to facilitate and also to help out with the curriculum design. And this is part of the um, part of the um, the role as an English teacher because subject teachers really, really needed, uh, really, really need your help. And here we have PE teacher and um, and you know the 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 school that I observed in Kaohsiung, um the in the rural area, they don't have PE teacher um, at the school. So the PE teacher is not really, does not have the background in PE, but a background in um, math education and in history. Um, and they're have, they had to design PE lessons with the help of an English teacher. So it was really, really challenging. Um, and, um, but the, the kids all, Responded, responded positively uh, toward the, you know, learning, learning PE in English because they've learned the term of like a uh, uh, neck, neck circle in the warm up or shoulder uh, circle, uh, things like that. And they think that they're learning uh, more from a uh, PE class, um, you know, so, so we don't know whether you know there there are challenges. Okay, um, here we here we have a music teacher and she's a homeroom teacher. And this 
music teacher, has a great command in English, but um, and she's a great candidate for teaching music in English, but she's a homeroom teacher and she doesn't have time uh, to take care of her homeroom class, but also on top of that, she needed to um, teach music bilingually. And so she stopped after one year of trying to teach music bilingually. So these are some of the challenges. Also, some of you mentioned in the chat that you're interested in assessment. So one of the biggest challenges is assessment. So are we, do we assess students in content only or content and language or language only? Okay, um, this, is the, yeah, the, this is a question. Uh, assessment of key principles in, in Chinese and portfolio assessment in English, that's one way of doing it. Assessment of, of key principles in English with a parallel first language assessment of major concepts, that's an, a different one. Um, but here you can see um, uh, um, sixth graders, they're learning, sci they learn science uh, in English and they do not have um, paper and pencil test um, um, in English on science. But what they did was they, they hosted um, science stations and have the sixth graders teach the third graders, the fourth graders, and the fifth graders um, the science concepts and the science experiments so that the, these sixth graders had the opportunity to explain how, how to, um, how, how, how this by step by step, uh, uh, guiding them through the process of the science um, project. Um, so that's one way, um, you know, multiple assessment. And this is one way of assessing uh, kids and giving them opportunity to use what they learn and teach someone else. OK, so but what about formative assessment? Um, yeah, um, this is a type of for, like, you know, we what what they did was they incorporated um, formative assessment instead of summative assessment. So. Um, they did have a one part of um, paper and pencil test um, specifically in English, but that's just um, uh, to give the students chance to earn additional points. And, and so, you know, there are different models in Taiwan and uh, should it be, uh, you know, instructed in L1 and key concept in L2, or should it be, uh, should should the key concepts be introduced in both languages? Um, or for long-term CLIL programs, um, uh, language teaching complements um, content teaching. Um, do we have this, you know, uh, the language teaching complementing com uh, uh, content teaching and um, um, having, you know, assessing kids in English and both in both English and Chinese. Okay. And also there's also enough different another question in terms of curriculum, like what curriculum? Because right now um, you know the a lot of there's a there's there's a debate whether or not we use the class time to teach science or do we use the um, flexible class hours to teach science. Um, and um, you know, teachers are 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 coming up, up with different models of you know and designing the curriculum. And and the English teacher's role is you know help facilitate um, the curriculum development as best as we can. So these are the different CLIL factors: teacher availability, uh, CLIL language fluency, time, CLIL model. How are content language being integrated out of school, CLIL or networking assessment processes? And here we, we have an English teacher teaching science and the students discuss, discussing and reordering the science uh, sci experimental process. Um, and so the, the English teacher is teaching science and, um, you know, differently um, than uh, how a science teacher would, would, would conduct the science class. Okay, so before we move on, and um, I'd like to you to go back to uh, the Mentimeter and 
Um, I like your, your, let me stop sharing. I like for your input on what you think would, would be difficult in terms of uh, bilingual education. Let's see. This is the, uh, here, here it is, okay. Okay. I need to go back and do this, okay. Okay, um, please go to Mentimeter and I like your um, input on what would be the most difficult aspect of CLIL um, when it comes to an English teacher helping out in bilingual education? What do you think would be most difficult? Like, what do you think in terms of um, one being least difficult, five being most difficult? Um, Okay. Wow. Very good. Okay, we have two responded already. And Govinda Johnson has a question in the chat saying, how can English teachers do CLIL unless they are knowledgeable about these different subjects? science, math, and history? And that's a really good question. And um, to answer your question, I think, I believe that English teachers are now um, having to uh, learn all these different areas and, you know, the content and the language in these areas um, in order to help out these subject teachers. Um, in, because, um, Sub, the subject area teachers often their um, English proficiency is not as high as an English teacher and um, they really needed the English teachers to help and what the subject teachers are good at it you know um, are like the um, subject area pedagogies they know how to teach it they just don't know the language part part of it and so um, there's been a great like uh, for 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 English, some English teachers think that, wow, I get to learn these science terms, and you know, and it's a great, it's a new part of learning for me. For for myself, I, when I'm teaching the 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 um, the lesson on mode, I was like, oh, this is so interesting. I get to know the different parts of the mode and what they are called and how to observe them, um, and for me. Um, it's a new, new type, new, uh, I'm taking on a new role in learning something new in science. And um, in terms of teaching it, I had the help w from a science professor um, guiding me uh, um, in teaching it through a more scientific approach. And so, so yeah, that's basically, you know, English teacher are having to be more knowledgeable in those different areas. And I think this is just um, um, if like, because um, our, the, the, the nation's goal is to, to become 2030 bilingual nation. And, um, you know, if, if the kids, you know, are learning these subject areas in, in English from very young, by the time they're in high school, um, perhaps they're, they would be more knowledgeable in science, math, and history, um, or, or, or history in, a, in both languages, in Chinese and English. Um, perhaps I'm over op optimistic, but um, if uh, we've, we are providing them with a solid bilingual education, perhaps uh, uh, the next generation of college students, they're, they're well equipped with the uh, ability to um, um, in the vocabulary and the language and the concepts in, in both languages. So here we have um, 15 of you. Thank you for uh, filling this out. Um, and perhaps I should give you this link again. Okay. If 
it's right here. Okay. If you go could go on and you know provided uh, give me some of your thoughts so that I know that for masters and doctoral level of students, um, uh, what do you think in terms of like the difficult aspects of CLIL? And from 15 um, people's feedback, we, um, you guys are least, um, you think that implementing soft CLIL is least difficult, but it's most difficult is hard CLIL or bi bilingual assessment. And definitely uh, these are the two different areas where in, um, English teachers, um, or not just English teachers, but you know, science teachers also, uh, or your know, subject area teachers also find it most most difficult. Um, and bilingual assessment, yeah, bilingual assessment. And um, so you're not worried about your English language fluency, your um, or teacher availability. That means that you are um, quite okay with um, devoting yourself in bilingual education. That's real. That's really wonderful. Um, but you also think that content knowledge is more challenging. Okay, so um, yeah, per, I you know I'm I'm not sure because Shida right now um, are are offering a lot of EMI courses. I'm not sure if if you could uh, take um, courses from other departments. If you can, I you know highly encourage you to do so. If you are uh, if you are you, if you think you're interested in those areas, um, right now my students um, pre service English teachers are I encourage them to take all different types of classes like you know bilingual science class and um, math class you know so that they could teach these areas bilingually. So yeah, okay so. We have 22, so it's it's about the same, about the same, okay. But there's also, okay. I am going to go back and switch to this, okay. Um, a diff, a you know, a different. I'm not sure if you are aware of this term called translanguaging, being able to, you know, allowing learners to use different ways of communicating um, in using their whole language repertoire in communicating in learning. Um, and part of, I think as an, as an English teacher, um, we need to have a strong belief, uh, know our own belief, okay? We need to be aware of our own belief in translanguaging. I notice, I know that um, currently the Ministry of Education is uh, trying to promote teaching English in English. So teaching an English course in, you know, it's sort of the uh, EMI approach to English class. Um, but you know, if you know, you know, uh, CLIL and bilingual education, um, one of the one of the uh, accompanying um, concept is translanguaging and allowing learners to learn learn uh, through their own mother tongue. And I think we are we. This is a common practice in Taiwan already, and um, but what 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 we, what we need is to promote uh, the use of English uh, in the subject area classrooms. And so often there are questions, um, there are questions like how, how much English is, uh, you know, is, should, should be, uh, should there be in, in a bilingual class? Um, can we use Chinese? Um, how much Chinese is, is, you know, so, so, um, there's pe people who think that 20% um, of English is, will, will be sufficient, but there are people who think that 50% of English is our goal or even 75% is our goal, you know, so that students 
could be immersed or exposed and you know there's enough input in that link in in both in in the english language so this is one of the things that uh you know topics or you know as an english teacher you really need to have a strong belief um for myself as a teacher educator the way i train my students is um i ask them to be able to teach um teach whatever subject or topic in English only, okay? But that's only part of the training so that they have the ability to teach in English so that they're confident. But when it comes to teaching kids, I brought them to different schools to teach kids. It is, you know, you really need to incorporate translanguaging um, and ways of helping them, you know, understand, um, the concepts well. So, so um, you know, there's different, this, there's different uh, beliefs in translanguaging. Some people think translanguaging is only between Chinese and English. But if you, uh, if you read um, on up on Li Wei's um, translanguaging, you would know that translanguaging also incorporates multimodality uh because it's um we could express through different models models and and so it's not just between you know chinese or english uh it's also you know uh different like body language is also included in translanguage as well so yeah so here are some of the your beliefs on nine people participated in uh you know having uh you know, shared their opinions on these. Um, people should avoid mixing uh, these. They think that it's okay to mix languages and it's negative use of another language than English during the, so they disagree on this statement. So it's okay to uh, use both languages and that's, yeah, perhaps what we would like uh, everybody to know that it's okay to use the mother tongue. Um, and um, it's a, you know, languaging, translanguaging helps students to better understand and these, um, and it's a pedagogical technique um, to help kids understand and, um, okay. And not so much as encourage students to use their native language in the classroom, but but uh, at a certain time when they need to, they they should be feel free to express um, their thoughts in, in, in Chinese as well. Okay, so thank you for participating in this translate languaging. So um, uh, as an English teacher, um, uh, you know, the subject area, te subject teachers, sub subject area specialists would, would need a lot of your help, um, um, you know, in providing the language terminologies um, in the subject areas um, and um, in encouraging them to to explain in English, um, you know. So, so let me go to my next uh, slide. Let me stop sharing. Okay, and let me share this. Okay. Okay, let me go back to this Padlet. Okay, so like I said, um, first of all, for this uh, for this uh, performing arts lesson, originally they had the English teacher teaching the nine stages in English. So the the class is divided into like a ten minute lesson on the nine staging. How how do you uh, the stages the, the nine uh, blocks of stages and where you should place the uh your main character and how to express you know but in the second half the um, performing arts teachers was asking them to perform with this uh hua mulan scenario both in uh in you know in uh english mulan and her camaraderies fought against the enemy the general in the enemy gave orders to in the in the distance the ghosts of Mulan's dead comrades rooted for Mulan's army and then having them plan out um, how they would uh, perform um, 
and uh, I I believe that they've uh, this is the like in 2021 this is this would be their third year in employing the performing arts, and I think they've uh, improved and and um, and uh, you know had a really engaging curriculum for the junior high school students. What I was amazed was the um, DNA um, in the DNA class um, for science. And um, this Shida uh, preservice teacher, he really used a lot of visuals and like the cards and simplified language to explain um, the structures of DNA, giving a definition of DNA. Um, simple enough for my son, a sixth grader, to understand. And here, um, he 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 was filling out the. You know, it's important to know these uh, the lab materials, and he was filling these materials um, on the worksheet. And this term um, called well, because it's learned in English only. Um, when we were conducting the DNA experiment, um, inserting the DNA sample into the well, we could, it's so tiny, we couldn't find where the well is. And we're asking, where is the well? Where is the well? And we weren't asking it in, in Chinese because we don't know what, the, what that well is called in, in Chinese. So, so this is some of like the experiences. Um, and it was so engaging that it, it was really engaging. They were, you know, uh, identifying the, uh, the repeated pattern in, in the DNA. And um, my son was, you know, he, he was so involved. He, he represented the group in, in presenting um, the finding. I'm not sure this is, okay. Perhaps you could watch it in your own time. I've already shared this padlet to you. Oops. Okay. But yeah. Um, so these are, you know, these are the works of a cl collaboration between subject preservist teachers and um, language teachers, language preservist uh, teachers. And so um, the bilingual preservist teachers, they couldn't uh, have planned or, you know, uh, plan out this lesson without the help of English uh, teachers. And so, you know, you know, as in so English teachers play a very important role in implementing bilingual education, not just assisting it, but also we also, you know, need to enhance students subject area literacy. OK, because, um, you know, the, uh, the science text is different from what you have for you know the you know your your english our english textbook for junior high school students it's you know so different and so subject area literacy needs to be introduced in the science class and and um in helping kids understand okay so um in the end you know i know that most of you are ma ma students and um PhD or you know doctoral students, these are some of the um, research areas that that might interest you. Okay, so this is the Journal of Immersion and Content-Based Language. Content-based Journal of oh wait Content-Based Language Education. Okay, and it's um, edited. It's you know it's it, the editors are. Yuan Yi Lo, Lo and Angel Lin. And um, as you can see um, in the articles, uh, this is mainly like with the science focus. And there are different ways or different topics to focus on when it comes to science. Um, and um, you could like you could look at, you know, the language use and the learning content in a science class. Uh, you could also look at teachers' language awareness um, or uh, classroom talk, classroom talk. So right now, a lot of English teachers or researchers have been focusing on discourse analysis or classroom, 
classroom talk or conversational analysis in the classroom. And that's one way of one, you know, one, uh, you know, area that you could focus on um, in helping out bilingual education, because we really like more research done in, you know, analyzing the classrooms of um, uh, bilingual, cl the classrooms of, you know, uh, of bilingual uh, lessons. Okay, so, and also there's people, there are a focus on scaffolding cognitive and linguistic challenges in CLIL, okay, and how do you provide scaffolds, and there's different types of scaffolding. So um, this is, you could look at this, you could read this in, in your own time, but four different types of scaffolding involving linguistic scaffolding to simplify and make English language more access, accessible. There's conceptual scaffolding, providing students with supported frameworks for meaning um, by providing organizational charts, metaphors, used visuals or modeling. There's also social scaffolding. So uh, using social interaction to support and mediate learning through group work, peer coaching, et cetera. But there's also cultural scaffolding um, using artifacts, tools, and informational sources that are culturally and historically uh, situated uh, within a domain of familiar, domain familiar to learners. In other words, um, providing, knowing their power knowledge in their own culture and being able to uh, provide more like cultural scaffolding. Okay, so this is, and how you, um, you know, we re really need people, uh, researchers in, in looking at how we scaffold for students to understand. And, you know, this is conceptual scaffolds and uh, one of the, like, one episode here, and um, you go through classroom talk and coded coding it into, you know, you know, different types of cognitive scaffolds. Um, so information such as this is would be wonderful um, if you're interested. And um, uh, for me, I'm a, like a, I focus on vocabulary. And I, what I did was I did a vocabulary analysis um, and, um, and look at vocabulary demands in, in for science and for the mode, uh, class, I've, uh, I've, um, you know, typed up my, the, the whole, um, lesson verbatim and, um, and use LexTutor to analyze the, and found out that I've used, um, 89% of my instruction is in K1 words and, um, and, um, about around, uh, 91% is done like uh for the first 2k words so it's i really i was really using simple language and for these k6 7 8 9 words are really science terms so they are you know very difficult but because these science terms are are repeated over and over again like mycelium sporangium so it's it's not you know it's not worrying because because of the exposure and the number of times of exposure, they get to, you know, learn the term. Um, okay, so, um, and the language triptych, you might also under, you know, know about that. Um, this is the example of spore and sporangium, although it's off list words, but for example, predict is a 5K word, but we use predict a lot in science. Prediction is an 8K word. It's also used often in science. Microscope, uh, surprisingly, it's a 9K word, but since they're using the microscope, this is not no big deal. They understand this. Mycelium is actually a 50K word, but because of this drawing, they know this my mycelium is actually this part of the mode. So that's just, um, yeah an example. So what you can do is you can really go into a, you know, or download uh, um, like classroom videos and, you know, and, and analyze um, and build up your own corpus and analyze the vocabulary for it. And this is what I did um, for, for the, for my own class, for the um, classes that my students has taught. I've, I've compared um, 
the vocabulary used in fifth grade or sixth grade. And so if you're interested, um, you know, uh, this is this is definitely something that we really need um, in order to build a a to get to know like what what students are actually learning in these bilingual lessons. So as a lingua English teacher or English language uh, educator or researcher, um, I highly encourage you to um, conduct like vocabulary analysis. Um, I've even used um, downloaded the Peekaboo Kids for like the science um, science videos and analyzed all the science videos um, and found out that um, um, over for 95% of coverage, um, kids need to have 4K words, 4K. So, so looking back at our national curriculum for elementary school kids, um, when they only need, are required to learn 300 words, it's it's really not enough. And um, um, but through these bilingual lessons, they're able to. Oh, I'm not sure if I'm if you saw my sharing. Oh, you weren't, you didn't, you did not see my sharing all this time? Yeah, no, we, we saw the the the, uh, the slide you just turned off. Oh, we didn't okay. actually see. Uh, did you see the, um, the genially, the, the slide on genially? No. Um, the different lessons that I showed. Okay. No? I think we saw the different lessons, but once you started talking about the Journal of Immersion, I think that's when we stopped seeing what you were talking oh, about. Sorry, I, I didn't know, I didn't notice it. It wasn't, uh, I wasn't sharing the right um, window. Okay. All right. But yeah, I know the time is all, almost up. Um, let me see. And uh, let me quickly, uh, if you have any questions, I'm going to leave the uh, last um, 10 minute for Q&A. Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you so much, um, Dr. Chen, for giving us, for sharing with us uh, lots of uh, bilingual teaching examples. It was very uh, interesting and very informative. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, and as everybody know, uh, Dr. Chen is an expert in the area. So uh, please uh, use this precious opportunity to raise your questions, uh, if you have any, uh, towards bilingual teachings and, and the roles of English teachers uh, or content teachers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so are there questions? So um, yeah, this this link is the the slide that I was uh, going over in my last um, ten minute of talk. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, it's okay. it's on um, vocabulary demands for for um, science. Okay. There um, was a question uh, on the uh, in the message box uh, mm -hmm. given by the audience. Um, given the rate of progress you've seen so far, do you think 2030 bilingual goal is feasible? That was one of the questions posted. Okay. Uh, yeah, in the message box. So I guess we'll start with that. And, and if anybody has any questions, um, yeah, feel free to raise your hand. I'm not sure if I'm the right person to answer that question. <laughs> and I, I would like to ask that same question myself. <laughs> I think it's definitely challenging. And um, but I a lot of people are now really um, devoting into bilingual education and making it possible. Um, so I'm if it's feasible, I'm not sure. But we're definitely um, heading that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So are there any uh, questions? Uh, do you think content teachers also need B2 for English proficiency certification? Oh, okay. That's a, that's a good one. Um, um, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I think it's tough. Um, a lot of teachers are really working on that. Um, uh, this morning, I went to um, Jingxing Elementary School. Um, they are one of the schools that are implementing the MOE's, um, you know, uh, bilingual program. 
and the PE teacher, he, she is, because there's uh, like, um, um, each, each teacher had a certain like budget dedicated for language improvement, like language uh, enhancement, language proficiency enhancement. So, so that TP teacher cur is currently taking four hours of English lessons um, in improving her English. And she really taught PE wonderfully and kids love it and I really enjoyed it. And, um, and um, but, but she's missing uh, some of the verbs um, in her instruction, for example, uh, she was saying, uh, please, please everybody in the middle. Instead of go to the middle, she said in the middle and or um, uh, thumbs, uh, everybody, th something like um, thumbs in, thumbs, thumb, thumb, thumbs in your ear, but, but instead of, it's not just like, you know, uh, it, she has something before that, and so what she really needed was put your thumbs in your ear instead of uh, thumbs in your ear. But there's there's the beginning portion to it. Also, for a full sentence, she's missing the verbs in the sentence. So, so I would think um, it you know if if subject teachers are willing to improve their English language, um, and and help deliver a really, uh, I, I think they, it would really help out um, the learners in, in learning um, the subject areas in English. Um, yeah, more wonderfully, so. Mm -hmm. Do Professor Chen have the, any advice for senior high schools about to adopt bilingual programs based on the experiment from primary schools? Well, I think, you know, high schools are different than um, primary schools. Um, I I think they they have a better command in English, but not all um, but not all um, high school students are good at reading. I think reading should be promoted, especially subject area literacy. Um, I my my son's um, my son's best friend, um, his sister was really struggling with. Uh, it, when she was in high school, she was really struggling with reading, and she didn't even know that ch uh, can be pronounced k and ch, and so she was pronouncing the ch words incorrectly, and it really hinders her uh, reading comprehension. And so, um, we really like um, so uh, even for high school students, they really needed help with the reading part and read it loud and subject area uh, literacy. So, um, so, but, but when I, when, when I sent my son, when my son and I went to Zhang Shida to participate in the DNA um, class, it was, it was amazing. Um, this team has used very simple language and giving us this scenario of someone being killed in the lab and, you know, so they extracted several samples and, you know, we needed to, to test out like five different samples and, and um, in search for um, what and, and, and determine which one is the victim's uh, sam DNA sample and which one is the murderer's sam you know, sample. And so um, they really use very simple language to explain very difficult concepts. Um, and so, you know, even my son has, at the time he was sixth grade, um, he was really involved and he understood uh, the lesson. And so I think um, the bilingual approach to uh, like science or different areas is really invigorating the curriculum. And because I know there's a lot of preparation behind that um, in order for it to be successful. But I know all of you here who are here, um, all of you who are here today, is, um, are willing to perhaps willing to try because you've all, you've devoted your time in getting to know like what what we can help how we can help um, bilingual education. So yeah. So we will uh, we have two more questions and maybe we can address that mm -hmm. and um, that will be um, yeah. Okay. Is it fine when the order in which students learn grammar points and 
is determined by the content needs and not by the natural order. Yes, of course. Uh, I think um, there isn't like a, I know pe some people believe in the natural order of, you know, but um, I think um, if right now kids are learning the content bilingually, um, um, I think it's a more natural way of learning the language um, in terms of grammar. Um, I, I don't think there should be a certain, like, we should learn present tense before past tense kind type of thing. Um, based on research, of course, um, based on the past, like CLT or, you know, different approaches to introducing grammar, perhaps that's a, there's a an order, uh, which is like, which kids could learn them more easily. But but we're trying out a different approach, the, you know, content-based or, you know, bilingual education. Um, I, I definitely think that um, this should not be the case. Kids should not be, we should not tailor our curriculum towards a grammar-based curriculum, but a more um, content-based, um, based on the concepts they kids are learning, concepts or skills they're learning. Mm -hmm. How much language correction of students should be done in CLIL classes? Is it enough to just encourage or reward them for talking at all, or should we, be ensuring they're using proper grammar and pronunciation even though it is not an English class? Well, I think um, uh, right now the approach is to recast um, and, you know, once if there's like a mistake or an error, uh, the teacher could recast and 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 um, demonstrate the, the proper or, or reiterate uh, in a proper in an appropriate term, but the focus would be more on um, on the content and the content learning. So we would not stress so much on you know um, you know error correction in a content language class. Um, but if you engage learners in the writing writing up a report, for example, a science report, but definitely. Um, correct their grammar, um, that would help them uh, indeed. Um, for if it's a proper, like, um, if it's a proper presentation, um, I, you know, uh, so this is like a fluence, fluency or accuracy uh, type of debate, but, but I think um, we are going to focus more on the content area um, or concept learning uh, um, and placing a little bit less emphasis on like um, language accuracy, uh, but do provide them with um, correct, corrective feedback. Yes. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor Chen, um, for uh, sharing your expertise with us today. And I hope there will be other opportunities uh, to invite you back uh, to share uh, more uh, information with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. And I will see you guys around. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.